This is the Tillingbourne, a small but very busy Surrey River. The river emerges a few hundred metres behind these trees, just to the northeast of Leith Hill Tower. Leith Hill is the highest point on a ridge of sandstone rock called Greensand that was laid down at the bottom of a shallow sea around 110 million years ago. The Greensand Ridge forms the southern boundary of the Vale of Holmesdale. You are looking north towards its northern boundary, the 90 million year old chalk ridge of the North Downs. Beyond is the 1,016 feet high shard, also the height of the top of Leith Hill Tower. Around 100 million years ago, a layer of clay was deposited. This forms the floor of the Vale of Holmesdale. Water cannot penetrate clay, and so a number of small rivers flow along it. The Tillingbourne tumbles down into the Vale, then turns west before it flows into the Way Navigation at Shalford. The river's length is about 15 miles. From this lofty but rather unprepossessing rise here on Leith Hill at Duke's Warren, the river quickly becomes a swan. The name Tilling is odd because the sandy soil here makes poor farming land, but trees grow everywhere. Trees, water, gravity, and the one thing the soil here is loaded with are soon exploited. This is a hammer pond. It is an artificial pond formed by barring the flow of a river through a dam. This would store up a weight of water to power a water wheel. The wheel would be used to lift the hammer, to hammer out iron. Gravity has other uses. Notice that the water is brown. That's because the green sand soil is full of ironstone, conglomerations of iron minerals washed out when the green sand was laying down. So in the initial northern fall of the Tillingbourne towards the Vale of Holmesdale, we have taken in the water, gravity, wood and iron that together dominate the history of this now demure little river. Below the Tilling Falls, the river swings left. This western turn is indeed sinister because it takes us towards the Wooted estate of the Evelyn family, signs of George Evelyn, 1526 to 1603, England's first manufacturer of gunpowder. The Evelyn family pile is Wooten House, now a hotel, and the confluence of the Eastern and the Friday Street branches of the Tillingbourne. Friday is a place name that may be associated with the day of fasting, barren land, which is true of the sand at Friday Street, but iron is plentiful and was worked locally. This is the Friday Street Hammer Pond, and this is its bar dam, And this is believed to be the Iron Master's Cottage. The raw ironstone has too much oxide to be useful. The water stored in the hammer pond would turn water wheels powering both a hammer forge and a set of bellows to blast oxygen into a furnace. The ironstone would be heated in the charcoal fueled furnace so that the oxide in the stone would react with the carbon from the charcoal to produce pig iron. The remaining slag would then be beaten out of the pig iron by hammers in the forge to produce wrought iron bars for sale. Ironstone was also very commonly used for building, as in this bar dam just downstream from Friday Street. Water wheels can also turn grindstones. George Evelyn ground gunpowder, but his descendant John Evelyn used the money to garden. These pretty grade two listed gardens at Wooden House and the Tilling Falls are the legacy of the 16th century arms trade.
There were at least 24 mill sites along the length of the river, although none working. Along with gunpowder and iron, the river literally made money by paper milling banknotes. Now the main industries are fish farming and watercress cultivation. Jack the blacksmith here at Abinger Hammer is a reminder of more percussive times when the water wheel drove an 880 pound hammer at the local forge. In between striking the hours, Jack can watch in the summer months the local cricket matches. Children paddle in the sandy stream, which is here joined by the Holmbury St Mary tributary. At Gomshaw, the Tillingbourne runs alongside the A25 directly below the chalk hills of the North Downs. The shallow sea that covered the green sand deepened about 100 million years ago and the quieter water allowed clay sediments to be deposited. Around 90 million years ago, these chalk hills started to form from the shelves of billions of tiny sea plankton. By then, the sea was shallow and warm again, but a long way from land sediment, so the chalk is often pure white. The Tillingbourne flows over the watertight clay sediment. This is the old wild smuggling village of Shear. The sandstone allowed for rather large cellars, which many of the local houses have. They allegedly were not full of watercress. Next comes Albury Park with its mansion and another listed John Evelyn garden. The village of Albury itself was moved half a mile west to what used to be called Western Street. Albury Park is now a retirement home, I believe, not far from heaven. Most of what's left of the original village of Albury is the Church of St Peter and St Paul. Parts of the church, such as the lower tower, date back to Saxon times. Other bits, such as the cupola, are 19th century, including this chapel, which was designed by A.W. Pugin, who did the tower housing Big Ben. This is the chapel of Sir Henry Drummond, born 1786, son of Sir Henry Drummond Sr. and, more worryingly, husband of his close relative, Lady Henrietta Hay Drummond. Sadly, their sons predeceased them. Sir Henry was the local MP, a fellow of the Royal Society and a city banker. It was Sir Henry who decided to move Albury half a mile to the west and away from this gentleman who invented the multiplication sign. Sir Henry multiplied churches. He replaced St Peter's and St Paul's with a boring brick C of E parish church in relocated Albury, but doubled up with a new church very much his own. Not only did he physically build this, the Catholic Apostolic Church in Albury, but also elected himself an apostle. The church certainly was Catholic, the Pope was asked to join, but didn't. In fact, the congregation, after speaking in tongues and awaiting the second coming, had all but died out by the middle of the 20th century. Which does beg the question of who is maintaining this rather elegant edifice, which is made entirely from local stone. This cottage is also displaying its local credentials. The green weatherboarding shows that it belongs to the Albury estate. To the north of Albury is the chalk spring that feeds the only tributary of the Tillingbourne coming from the Downs. The chalk gives the water its blue tint. Like many springs, the pool here, called Silent Pool, is associated with a female mythological character. A maiden is supposed to have been surprised by a knight and retreated modestly into the middle of the lake. Then, rather bizarrely, she drowned. The lake isn't deep and dries up entirely, sometimes in summer. She must have been very modest. Silent Pool abounds with introduced rainbow trout. Brown trout are farmed for fly fishing, but most of the river is not good for fish because of the many mill dams, fast flowing water and sandy soil. It is a harsh environment for young fish particularly, although the Surrey Wildlife Trust and the local council are trying to make the river more eco-friendly. 
Yet another bizarre female drowning myth is that Agatha Christie was feared to have surrendered herself to the lake in 1926 when her car was found abandoned just up the hill at Newlands Corner. She turned up in Yorkshire two weeks later, having assumed the name of her husband's paramour. Silent Pool flows into the Sherborne Pond, which in turn empties into the Sherborne Brook that flows towards Albury. Albury may not be where it once was, but it's still a very pretty village. The last working mill on the Tillingbourne was actually called Albury Mill, although it was located here at Postford and closed in the 1990s. Postford, just west of Albury, is also where the Law Brook joins the river, after rising near Pease Lake to the southwest. The most notorious mill on the Tillingbourne is here at Chilworth. The river was navigable here by punt, and so saltpetre and sulphur came in for milling and gunpowder kegs went out. The East India Company established a gunpowder mill here. The muskets and cannon of the parliamentarians in the English Civil War were powered by Chilworth mills, as were the guns on the Western Front in the Great War. The wide floodplain of the Tillingbourne allowed dispersal of plant and pioneering work in protective enclosure was carried out here, but there were many deaths. For example, in 1901 six men died because of a spark from the drag sole of a hobnail boot. Production ceased in 1920 and since then the peace has most often been disturbed by people fly fishing without a permit. West of Chilworth, the river hides between the railway line to Reading and the slopes of St Martha's Hill before finally heading north. The best preserved mill is at Shalford. It's Grade 2 listed and owned by the National Trust. The mill was saved for the nation by the Ferguson Gang and their generous donations. The gang was unmasked much later as six very well brought up ladies with a taste for issuing anonymous Mockney communiques. Then comes the Tilling's last stretch. Tilling in Old German has a connotation with striving, which is appropriate for such a busy river. Its last bit of business is to be intercepted by a Shalford pumping station. Millions of gallons of the river are extracted here to water the folk of Godalming and parts of Guildford. So although the Bournes junction with the river way isn't as pretty as its earlier cascades, it's nicer than some of its last. 